Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Meg Terrell. And I'm Damian Garde. Adam Forestine is away this week. It's Thursday, March 23rd, and here's what we're going to talk about this week. The eyes of the biopharmaceutical world turned to Washington this week as Moderna CEO Stefan Bonsell defended the company's vaccine pricing before the likes of Senator Bernie Sanders. We'll discuss what happened and what it means for an industry under fire. We'll also talk about the latest news in the life sciences, including Regeneron's latest data for its powerhouse drug Dupixent, an about face for Sarepta, and how the FDA appears to view biomarkers in neurological diseases. But first, a word from our sponsor. Calling all healthcare innovators and biotech enthusiasts. Are you ready to discover the cutting edge developments at the intersection of medicine, biology, and technology? Mark your calendars from May 3rd and 4th to join the STAT Breakthrough Summit in San Francisco. This exclusive event features industry thought leaders such as Dr. Mary Claire King, known for her groundbreaking discovery of the BRCA1 gene, and Dr. Kazmekia Corbett, whose team developed the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, and Jennifer Doudna, the co-inventor of CRISPR. You'll be at the forefront of the discussions driving the future of healthcare. Don't miss this rare opportunity to network with your peers and gain a deeper understanding of the thrilling advancements in healthcare and technology. Register now at statnews.com summit, and we'll see you there. Is it morally acceptable to say, I have a drug here that can cure you, save your life, and I'm sorry you can't afford the $50,000 that it cost? Is that the moral values of the United States of America? And I would contrast that attitude that we see today from Moderna and virtually all the other drug companies with what Jonas Salt said when he invented the polio vaccine that had such a profound impact. And you know what he got for inventing the polio vaccine? He got nothing. And he was proud of it. He gave a gift to the world that saved God knows how many lives. So I think we need to do some moral thinking about the role of the drug companies in our society. And I hope this committee will get into that. So that, of course, was Senator Bernie Sanders in his introduction to the uh, hearing with Moderna CEO Stefan Monsell over the planned coming price hike for its COVID vaccine later this year when the vaccine goes into the commercial marketplace. Moderna has laid out a, a pricing plan of $110 to $130 per dose. That's up from about $15 to $26 that they charged when the U.S. government was the sole buyer. Um, Pfizer has said it will uh, charge a similar price, and it actually came out with its pricing first. But because Moderna got money for the development of the vaccine from the U.S. government and even partnered with the NIH to develop the vaccine, Bernie Sanders has really focused squarely on Moderna. Um, Damien, how important was this hearing, both for Moderna and really the drug industry more broadly, going into Wednesday? I was curious about that. So going into Wednesday, you know, Stefan Bonsell volunteered to appear before this committee. He didn't have to be compelled, which we've talked about on this podcast as being, if not surprising, then, then definitely indicative of something. It felt weighty going into it because we have seen basically but through the passage of, of the IRA, which we've talked about ad nauseum, and, and the growing sort of bipartisan movement to, or rather, I guess, the notion of reining in drug companies and their ability to charge whatever the market will bear for their new products is one of the few, if not the only things that has bipartisan support, it would seem, in the Congress. And so all of that leading up to this moment where Bernie Sanders, who has a flair for the kind of um, speech that we just heard, would go head to head with Stefan Von Sell felt like something that could spark more action in in that field. What actually happened? I mean, well, well we both we both uh, set aside two hours of our lives to <laughs> experience this. What actually happened was was probably not quite that. And I think well, there's a multitude of reasons for that. I think in part because Moderna is not accountable for, for example, the cost of the cancer medicine Keytruda or mm-hmm. the sort of 
like transparently broken market for insulin, which are two things that came up during Wednesday's hearing. But of course, Moderna doesn't make either of those products. And also because vaccines are quite different, both in the value proposition that they propose and in how they're sold and how that market works than the kind of medicines that usually end up in these crosshairs. So in a few cases Wednesday, I thought there seemed to be kind of a chasm between the conversation some senators wanted to have and the conversation one can have with a guy like Stefan Bonsell. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also the case that like, that is almost always what happens in these hearings. Like, it's so frustrating to watch them because you just feel like the politicians are grandstanding and they're not actually trying to really accomplish anything. In this case, you know, I I was just super interested to to observe the the tone between Bernie Sanders and Stefan Bonsell. And really, you know, Bonsell's response to Bernie Sanders. So so Sanders really started out by just being like, I implore you to reconsider this price increase. Uh, part of me was like, is he just going to say that he will? Like, they'll just lower it? Like, <laughs> is that the whole play here? They're going to go to Washington and be like, there's no reason for this hearing. We're cutting the price in half or whatever. He did not do that. His argument for why the vaccine needs to have this higher price tag is because he said there's a lot of increased complexity once this goes into the commercial market. He said, you know, instead of having one customer, the U.S. government, they've got 10,000 customers now. They're going to reformulate this into uh, single dose files from 10 dose files or even pre filled syringes. The distribution is much more complicated, you know, 60,000 pharmacies and hospitals and doctor's offices versus like three CDC controlled warehouses. And he said they expect demand to go down by 90%. So all of that was sort of his reasoning for why they needed this higher price. He also argued that there was a lot of wastage of the doses that the U.S. government purchased. And so really, by that measure, the vaccines cost a lot more than $25 if you factor in all the wasted doses. And he said after they go into the commercial market, Moderna will have to shoulder that cost. So those were all of his reasons. And it kind of went back and forth. He refused to concede you know, that they should lower the price. However, if you watched Moderna's stock price through the course of this hearing, it went down, not hugely, but by about, you know, 2%. And I was talking with Jared Holtz from Mizuho, a favorite of uh, Vosner Simmons, the CEO of Novartis, at least uh, in his previous um, appearance on our podcast, uh, Jared's appearance. Um, Jared was saying he thinks the hearing actually was the reason for the little dent in Moderna's stock price, because he thinks with this much pressure being put on the company, maybe this price of the vaccine doesn't last. Maybe Moderna does have to fold and lower it to some degree. I guess we'll kind of see what happens there. But Damien, were there any other moments of the hearing that really stuck out to you? Well, I was interested going in how Bonsell would pitch himself in terms of, of you know, what his what he would kind of cling to in defending the company and also just what his diction might be like. This is someone we've seen, I think, most in his element at a series of J.P. Morgan healthcare conference presentations where he described Moderna as this potentially, you know, world changing company that had reduced the difficult process of drug development to the much more iterative process of software. And this goes back, I mean, to his credit about a decade, long before Moderna had made so much as a dollar, um, and this kind of like soaring rhetoric. And I think, you know, that came in for criticism and occasional mockery from his peers in biotech for making it sound so simple. But that that is in many ways the Stefan we know, the sort of like big thinking, big talking, um, private biotech CEO promising the world to anyone who would be willing to invest in his unicorn. And so I wondered if we were going to see any of that. And I don't think we really did in his prepared remarks. So we can listen to it right now. When I speak with an accent, I lead a company that is an American success story. After losing money for 10 years, Moderna created a vaccine that helped end the pandemic. Which to me kind of sounded like the opening words of The Godfather. And he later said <laughs> innovations like our vaccine can only happen in America. There was this very hmm. kind of like draping himself in the flag notion, which I suppose <laughs> is appropriate being in Washington and appearing before these senators. But that struck me as, as kind of odd because the the narrative he put forward is that yes Moderna is this American success story dating back you know the decade that I described and all of the risk that was taken by brave venture capitalists to fund this company with just an mRNA and a dream and now here we are etc but it was interesting because it kind of contrasted with his other point which was that yes Moderna received 
help from the federal government in the form of funding and procurement orders and everything that came with Operation Warp Speed. And, and they're very grateful for that and, and only in America, et cetera. But they didn't need it, per se. He said mm -hmm. multiple times that if Operation Warp Speed had not stepped in, Moderna still would have successfully developed its vaccine, just not as quickly as the United States and the world wanted and needed, um, as was the case in 2020. Which is interesting. That might be true. No, uh, you know, nobody brought up that you know a company like Novavax, for example, developed mm -hmm. their vaccine later than Moderna did, and they did not um, reap even a percentage of the spoils that Moderna did. That might be kind of secondary to that. But it was an interesting point to make, basically, which is that, yes, Moderna is an American success story, but no, we didn't necessarily need you. And then also to the point that Sanders brought up multiple times with the National Institutes of Health and the dispute over whether NIH scientists were co-inventors of the vaccine, Moderna continues to dispute that. And, and the way Stefan kind of ended the discussion um, at the hearing was to say that they agree to disagree with NIH on, mm -hmm. on just how integral NIH's work was to this vaccine. So I, this is a long-winded way of saying, I went into it, and I, I recognize that the Congress does not exist for my personal uh, entertainment. I went into <laughs> it kind of <laughs> expecting, if not hoping for, a little bit more fireworks between specifically Bonsell and Sanders. But I think what Bonsell did, which is exactly what he um, was probably you know wise to endeavor to do was avoided any kind of sound bites that could be used against him or his employer in any future uh, you know hearing or any future political ad or any future thing that could constrain Moderna's ability to charge what it wants to charge for its products, and just came across as thoughtful and calm and and to your point before got into the weeds of Moderna's changing supply chain and the actual stated justification for this price increase that people's mileage may vary with whether they think that makes $130 per dose reasonable. But you couldn't say that he kind of waved his hand and said, don't worry about it. He did seem to engage with the questions at hand. Yeah, speaking of, you know, trying to avoid sound bites, there was this moment where Bernie Sanders was asking Von Sell if he would consider lowering the price. I had this flashback to when we had Martin Shkreli on CNBC back in 2015 after he had raised the price of Daraprim. And we said, you know, given all of this outrage, all of these patients in hospitals having trouble finding this medicine, are you going to lower the price? And immediately he just said, no. And it became this like meme, you know, like it just went everywhere. And I was like, if if Bonsell responds, no, like, this is going to be a similar moment. Not that like it's it's like it has any other similarities to the Martin Scarley situation. But he, of course, gave a much more detailed, complex answer that, you know, in, in the end amounted to no. But you couldn't really, you know, soundbite that <laughs> in the same way. Um, I was wondering going into this how much Bonsell would see himself as a representative of the entire pharmaceutical industry. Because certainly I think the pharma industry saw this as an important moment for the whole industry. You know, you probably got the emails from pharma, the, the <laughs> lobbying group, with all the, you know, stats about how much they contribute to society, et cetera, et cetera, going into this. And of course, getting the emails from the other side, from groups like Public Citizen, you know, saying that the drug industry is super evil and Moderna is an example of that, et cetera. So the two sides were really gearing up for this to be bigger than just, you know, the Senate Help Committee and Bernie Sanders and, you know, Moderna and Stefan Bonsell. Um, you know, I, I felt like it, it was in some ways bigger because especially in the way Bernie Sanders approached this with the comparison to, you know, Jonas Salk and the broader moral questions about the role the drug industry plays in our society. And I think one of the exchanges that captured my attention and, you know, I tweeted it out and, and got a lot of sort of discussion going in the bio Twitter world um, was one right at the end where Bernie Sanders posed a question to Stefan Bonsell. Find a way to do it or it'll be too expensive. Right, but if we said to you, yeah. all right, we're going to cover, you're not going to fail, you'll be compensated. All right, we're willing to pay you Good money, you're gonna get rich, maybe not a multi-billionaire. You'll do very, very well. We'll cover the risk. But if you succeed, that formulation is gonna be available to people all over the world so that they can get that drug. We covered the risk. What do you think about that? I will have to look into the details, Mr. Chairman, because it, again, the risk is, I don't know how you, you manage the risk. I mean, are you suggesting in that thought process that the government will pay all of R&D of the entire yeah, industry? Yeah, exactly what I'm suggesting. Oh, okay. That's the deal. We're going to cover the R&D. You succeed, 
You're going to make profit, but the product goes all over to the world so that people can afford it. I think we'd have to understand the details to, to have an opinion. So this moment I thought was just incredible because Bernie Sanders is essentially saying the U.S. government, in addition to the $50 billion that it spends you know, at the NIH, which funds really early stage basic research, which is really important to the ecosystem of the biotech world, they would take on the many multiples more R&D spend of the entire pharmaceutical industry in exchange for you know the IP for drugs um, that succeed. Of course, taking on the risk of all the drugs that fail, which is sort of what Bonsell was trying to get at there. Um, his idea is we should do that, and that would make drugs accessible to everyone in the world. Um, Bonzel is just sort of politely saying, "Oh, okay, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that." Damien, what did you make of that? <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that exchange in part as, as someone who, like, when I watch these things and, and I see, as you said, you know, the, the grandstanding, the temptation is to be like, "Well, what are we really talking about here? Like, what are you really proposing?" And I was delighted to see Bernie Sanders kind of just say, like, here's what I'm proposing. Functionally, what if we nationalized the drug industry? This is kind of what he's describing. Or maybe nationalized a handful of companies. I don't know exactly. But what if, you know, putting money where mouths are, horrible phrase, whatever. But what if we actually did a thing where as adults, instead of just saying drugs should be cheaper or, you know, IP protections have gone too far, what if we actually imposed government control over some facet of the biopharmaceutical industry such that as he described the risks are covered but and there, there's some you know monetary reward for those who work on the development and invention of a needed medicine but at the end instead of recouping that investment through charging what the market will bear until the patent expires it just becomes something that belongs to the world which is a thought experiment that many others have had i saw the reaction on twitter people rolling their eyes bernie sanders doesn't understand pharma that may or may not be true but I think it's important to remember, like, serious academic debate about this, according to many people, broken model has happened for many years. The last time there was kind of a groundswell of it, I think, was the uh, initial launch of Gilead Sciences' curative medicine for hepatitis C, which had a list price of something like $84,000 for a course of treatment, which, you know, in, in strict actuarial sense was probably a bargain when you consider the societal value of curing someone of hepatitis C, but in actual reality where there's a finite number of dollars available for pills that do anything, it was completely impractical. And it got a lot of interesting and smart people thinking about other ways of doing this. Like, for instance, a large, almost like lottery prize money for inventing a new drug that its inventors would get. And then after that, you know, the, the patents would basically become public domain. I mean, we've had these discussions before, and I kind of feel like a lot of people in the drug industry would be more interested in engaging with this if it came from someone who wasn't uh, the independent senator from the state of Vermont. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Stefan, you know, doing uh, whatever his, his actual thoughts were in that moment. I appreciated him saying, like, well, I'd have to look at the details of communism. Right. Like, <laughs> like if, you could just, if you could just send me a white paper on, on, you know, Soviet science or Cuban science, because on some level, these things, what Bernie is describing has been sort of attempted. And, and there's probably a lot. I would defer to historians about just what that entails. Anyway, I, that was probably my favorite moment of it because it did feel like we were talking about the thing itself instead of just making points into a microphone and then saying, what do you think about that to the CEO that we had there? It was interesting. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. So one final thing, I wonder what you think about this, Meg, because we touched on this a little bit at the beginning. This, this hearing lands in the aftermath of uh, legislation that will allow Medicare to negotiate the prices of certain drugs. We've talked about the the fines that certain drug companies will have to pay when they raise the prices of medicines out of step with inflation. Pharma is in a moment right now, arguably a weakened moment, in that these policies seem to be advancing despite the industry's protestations of them. So this hearing happening during that conversation, do you feel like it moves the needle in any direction that Stefan's performance or Bernie's words or whatever will kind of alter that debate as it moves forward? Well, I was wondering if we were going to have this moment that would be similar to when the beloved children's television host, Mr. Rogers, testified in front of Congress trying to, I, th I think it was, in order to you know maintain funding for public television. And he ends up being just so inspiring that he like wins <laughs> over these very cynical politicians and they're all on his side at the end. And it's just, if you haven't seen it, it is just the most wonderful clip. And it, it's just lovely. But- 
there wasn't really that kind of experience with Stefan Bonzell. You know, he didn't manage to win over the entire Senate Help Committee to, you know, the side of the pharmaceutical industry. And I I, so I'm not really sure it changed anything tremendously. What I think it might have revealed is that it's it's going to continue to be tough going for pharma in Washington um, because Senator Bernie Sanders has this position as the chairman of this very important committee. Um, I'll be curious to see if other executives are as you know I'm not sure if the word is brave or, or you know willing <laughs> to accept like an in person. Uh, invitation like this like he really went to Washington and provided that you know that video shot uh, of him like sitting there facing all the senators you know a lot of now because of the pandemic people testify remotely and it's just not as powerful um you know interestingly we were talking about this on fast money our five o'clock show on CNBC Wednesday night and one of the traders you know was asked about how he approaches the healthcare space and the the pharma space after this hearing and he was like I don't I wouldn't say it's untouchable but it's really hard to be to be positive on the space when government is coming after it so hard, um, which I thought mm. was was really interesting. It's been a tough time for the industry, and it doesn't seem like it's going to get better, at least because of anything that happened this week. So if Mr. Rogers offers any lesson to the next CEO in this position, it's bring puppets, maybe. <laughs> that might have helped. <laughs> So speaking of other things that happened this week, let's go through some of the news. You know, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happened since we last recorded. Um, and I wonder maybe we should start with Sarepta because we had last spoken about the fact that Sarepta's stock soared because they said the FDA communicated to them that there would not be an advisory committee meeting for their gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, which people took to mean the FDA was feeling very positive on on it. They didn't need their advisors to weigh in. And then uh, subsequently we heard, oh, wait, the FDA is going to hold an advisory committee meeting and the stock plummeted. Damien, what did you make of all that? <laughs> I mean, zooming out from the stock trading or for this, the, the stock aspect of the story, it's not that strange. I guess it, it seemed a little odd when – it seemed as though the FDA were not going to have this advisory committee meeting, which you know people listening to this podcast know is they're not obligatory, but they are customary for new treatments, whether they be new uh, modalities like a gene therapy, for example, or um, treatments for a disease that don't have any or many approved therapies, which uh, at least in the latter sense applies to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this seemed like a case in which the FDA would want to hear out its advisors before making a decision for itself. So the notion, so the fact that they then put one on the calendar is not that weird. Now zooming into Sarepta, which is just like going back at least eight years now, a very volatile and very interesting uh, biotech stock and by extension biotech company, I can see where the like consternation comes from uh, as, to, as to what the agency will make of this gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but then at the same time, adding to the volatility, separate but not quite separate, did Peter Marks, a very high-ranking official at the in the FDA, say at a Duchenne muscular dystrophy conference that the agency should consider accelerated approval for gene therapies, meaning it should be more willing to look at surrogate evidence of efficacy for gene therapies and give them conditional approvals early in the process rather than waiting for full evidence or waiting for enough evidence to grant a full approval, which I don't know what effect that had on Sarepta stock. I know it led to a lot of conversations around gene therapy companies in general. I don't really know what to make of this. I guess after all of the weird permutations of this story, which is to say this gene therapy's uh, appearance before the FDA, we're kind of back to where we started six or eight months ago when we expected there to be an advisory committee and it was debatable whether uh, this this medicine would get approved, although I think people were leaning toward it possibly or it likely doing so. So in many ways, there's, it's like kind of much ado in order to get to where we started. Yeah. Well, in the same vein, then um, more recently, there was an advisory committee meeting for Biogen's ALS drug, Tofersen, in which the panel voted in favor of using a biomarker um, to predict um, clinical benefit. And I think, you know, the industry saw this as really important because the agency is kind of working its way through um, using biomarkers in this way for accelerated approval, you know, very similarly to how it has really done that a, a lot for cancer drugs um, and now starting to do that more for other diseases, including in neurology. Um, Damien, what were your takeaways from that? And also the fact, you know, this is a tiny potential drug, maybe 
potentially extremely important, though, for the people for whom, you know, it, it's applicable. Yeah, it, it was an interesting story to pick apart because, as you as you said, the the FDA's neurology division's embrace of surrogate markers has been somewhat controversial. I mean, the loud, the thunderclap of that was approving uh, Biogen's Alzheimer's treatment Aduhelm based on the surrogate marker of uh, its effect on amyloid plaques, which is a whole um, large dusty book that people are welcome to open uh, at their leisure. But it's it's since been kind of fits and starts as to, to just how will this division in particular and sort of the FDA at large expand its embrace of these measures. And so then getting to the Biogen ALS drug, where the measure in question is one that has been controversial. It's called neurofilament. It seems to be an indicator of the advance of neurological disease, but there's uh, maybe there's a whole podcast episode, honestly, digging into the debate over how reliable it is. But to your point, in this case, this is a medicine that is designed to treat a form of ALS, which is an already rare disease, that afflicts just 2% of the people diagnosed with ALS. It's about 100 patients each year is the last estimate that I saw. So the task before the FDA here is, of course, to consider uh, safety and efficacy, as it must with every new medicine, but also the dire and and unstoppable and fatal effects of ALS and also the tiny number of patients who would conceivably benefit from this medicine. And then on top of that, this surrogate marker and whether to get behind it. So the panel in question voted unanimously in favor of that neurofilament marker seems to um, predict benefit for these patients, but also voted uh, had a split vote basically that skewed toward the negative that the evidence Biogen has right now would support a full approval. And so it seems to set in motion that this medicine will win accelerated conditional approval, the same thing we were talking about um, for gene therapies or that's proposed for gene therapies. And it seems like that if that goes that way, it would be un fairly uncontroversial because of all the aforementioned things, especially the severity of the disease and the relative tiny number of patients um, who are waiting for this medicine. I also wonder then, like, where does Biogen price this? Um, like, there's so few patients. I, I saw a few analyst notes saying, like, as you said, you know, a couple hundred patients, like maybe there are 300 or fewer than 500 identified. So does Biogen treat this like a super ultra rare disease and charge like a million dollars a year? Or like, what do they do? And then like, what does CMS do with this? Um, because, you know, they obviously have had the very controversial decision on accelerated approval based on a biomarker that didn't necessarily prove clinical benefit in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is obviously a completely different disease um, and so few patients, but I just sort of wonder how that ends up playing out um, after this. So moving on, the other big news this week came from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, whose medicine Dupixent, a, I was going to describe it as a do-it-all, that sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but a, a medicine that has proved to be very powerful in multiple inflammatory diseases, extended its streak of demonstrating such power. What happened? Yeah, these were really highly anticipated trial results in COPD, um, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And a disease I actually didn't realize this, Regeneron points out in its press release, is the third leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, they say no new treatment approaches have been approved in more than a decade. Uh, and they showed here results that, according to the analyst reaction, surpassed what um, at least Wall Street was looking for. Uh, they said they showed a 30% reduction in moderate or severe acute exacerbations of COPD over the course of a year. Um, also d demonstrated improvements in lung function. Um, and quality of life and COPD respiratory symptoms. So um, this is a disease as opposed to, you know, what we're talking about with Biogen's ALS drug being maybe 300 patients. This is 300,000 patients. Um, analysts are saying this could add, you know, more than a billion dollars to an already giant drug in Dupixent um, for Regeneron and its partner, Sanofi. Um, it's great to see drugs working, right? Like you have to, as a reporter, you you don't want to be seen as rooting for the industry you cover, but like it's just good for people when drugs work. Um, and this one, you know, appeared to. And this is turning out to be a product, like a, a pipeline in a product where it works for a lot of different things. Um, so I'm not sure what else there is to say about this one. David, do you have any thoughts? It's also an interesting science story going back 
really now like a decade. I remember when Dupixin was just called Dupilumab, and the underlying theory was that it was attacking sort of the immunological root of a lot of inflammatory disorders. And the notion was, and, and credit to Regeneron, they were, I don't know if they used the phrase exactly, but they were kind of describing it as a pipeline in a product all those years ago, running through trials in um, atopic dermatitis and eczema and um, other inflammatory diseases. And kind of one by one, have they, if not entirely, mostly succeeded on all of the indications they've pitched for it. So it's continued success affirms that initial biological hypothesis about how the immune system works, um, which is interesting in its own right. And there's probably more to dig into there um, as to how Regeneron scientists came up with this idea. One thing that struck me, though, as as Dupixin becomes this or seems to be poised to become this massive blockbuster product is I do remember the last biologic that seemed to have so many uses in so many inflammatory diseases. Is and it Humira? Humira which, has, <laughs> <laughs> which has become sort of an epithet even within the drug industry, when people are comfortable speaking their minds to you, because AbbVie, the company that markets Humira, has uh, bent space and time when it comes to the American legal system <laughs> to prolong its exclusivity. And it's made billions and millions of dollars. The price of Humira has gone up um, over that time. And you know, speaking of congressional hearings, we've seen Richard Gonzalez in Washington more than once um, in the past few years. And so it'll be interesting, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, a company that that doesn't have AbbVie's corporate history, doesn't have that much in common um, with AbbVie or Abbott Labs, which came before it at all. It'll be interesting to see how Regeneron handles what is described as life cycle management, the mm -hmm. sort of bloodless term that the drug industry uses for the process of employing lots of lawyers to make sure you can make as much money as possible from your invention for as long as possible. And, you know, I mean, I guess, uh, Meg, as you know, like Regeneron is a company that pitches itself as being quite different from mm -hmm. many of its peers and, and follows through on that in many ways. But there will be a test of that philosophy in the years to come um, as Dupixin, you know, seemingly continues to become this massive cornerstone product in immunology. Yeah, and I, I don't think Regeneron is totally immune to those kinds of pressures. Um, at the same time, you know, their chairman is Roy Vagelos, the sort of legendary former CEO of Merck, um, who I remember hearing speaking at an industry conference sort of bef right before the pandemic um, about the industry's practice of raising prices by, you know, 10% a year on their products. And he called it sort of unconscionable. Um, he really does have a different approach to this. And he, and he believes that companies need to prove, you know, need to make money by developing really good drugs and continuing to develop really good drugs, not just developing one really good one and then pulling out all the stops to make as much money as possible from it. Um, and, you know, I think in the team he's got with Len Schleifer and George Yankopoulos, and I say the team he's got, I mean, these guys founded the company. Uh, <laughs> these guys are extremely dedicated to science and, and are motivated to develop new drugs. Um, not that everybody else in the industry isn't. Um, but I, I agree. I think what you lay out will be a fascinating thing to watch. And of course, it will be something that unfolds over the next few decades. Um, but we will watch it in that time period. That does it for another episode of The Read Out Loud. Thank you to Teresa Gaffney for producing this week's episode. Our senior producers are Hyacinth Empanado and Alyssa Ambrose. Our executive producer is Rick Burke. And our theme music is by Brian Joel. And we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you like about this week's episode, what you didn't like, and how much you missed Adam. You can do all of that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. See you next week. <laughs>